God's word. Let's just pray. Lord, thank you that we get to encounter you in all that we do, that you are here with us today. And Lord, we long to come into your presence, and we pray that you would open our hearts, open our ears to hear from you today, Lord. Do a work in and through us this morning. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, imagine with me a sculptor who has spent years making the most beautiful statue the world has ever seen. There have been countless sleepless nights and sweat and tears poured into the sculpture. It is a masterpiece. Its beauty will be known in far-reaching places. It will inspire future artists and fill books from art historians about its meaning and influence. And imagine that this sculpture is placed in the most prestigious museum in the world. But then one night, a tornado comes through and rips off the roof of that museum. And rain and hail pummel that sculpture. And then the next morning, birds fly over and drop droppings on that sculpture. And then someone breaks in with, and then they have it with a hammer. They just put divots all through it. And then kids come in, and they want to color and draw and write all over it. And my six-year-old, the only word he knows how to write is poop. So we can imagine like, what this sculpture would look like after all of these circumstances. This beautifully formed sculpture has become deformed. So what happens next? Does the artist come in and look at it and say, well, I guess it's ruined. Let's just toss it and start over. No, the artist poured his heart and soul into this sculpture, and he can still see its beauty and potential. So he looks at his sculpture with both grief and hope, and he begins the process of reforming it into its original beauty. So that's the story of the Bible, formation, deformation, and reformation. That's our story. God formed the world. He formed each one of us in his image, and then to be in relationship with him, to walk in freedom as children of God. And yet sin and evil and the lies of the enemy came in, and they continually deform us from that image. Paul will describe our sin like this in Galatians 5. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because it's a deformation of God's intention for us, his creation. But that's not the end of the story. God, in his mercy, sent his son to take on our sin, to die on the cross for us, and then pour out his spirit on those who believe. God's spirit is living and active in us. And through God's work, we are reformed in him, and we will be transformed into something far greater than we could ever imagine, far more beautiful and perfect. The master artist is not done with his creation. No one is beyond God's redemptive work of restoration and reformation, or reformation is another way to say that. I don't know about you, when you think of the word reformation, uh, my mind goes to a historic moment, the Protestant Reformation. And um, almost a little over 500 years ago, on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of a church in Germany. And many scholars believe that was the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. And what was taking place in history in that moment? Well, uh, Martin Luther, a scholar, a theologian, um, saw places in the institutional church that were deformed, that needed to be reformed. Because lies had seeped into the church, lies that said you could just earn your salvation, you could buy your pardon, you didn't need to surrender to Jesus, you didn't need to repent. Legalism, corruption had replaced the gospel of grace. And so Martin Luther wrote this little paper that God used in big ways, and the first one of the thesis on that paper that he nailed to the, to the wall said this, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he intended that the entire life of believers should be repentance. The entire life, all of life is repentance. See, that little statement 
is what sparked a massive season of renewal and reforming in the church. And Martin Luther didn't just make that up. He was quoting our gospel passage today out of Matthew 4. When Jesus comes, he begins his public ministry. He proclaims that the kingdom of God is here. And he calls his first followers to be his disciples. What is the first command he says to them? Repent. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then after Jesus' life and death and resurrection, we see the Holy Spirit descended upon the church in Acts. And Peter began to preach the story of God's redemptive work to all who would listen. And do you know what the command is that he gave to the little church and all the onlookers? Do you know what he said? In Acts 3.19, Peter said, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Repent and turn to God so that times of refreshing may come. Now we're in week two of a sermon series called Spiritual Renewal, and we are crying out for God to refresh us. Lord, pour out your spirit upon us. Do a fresh work in your church. We just sang, blow through the caverns of our soul with your spirit. We want to see an overflow of your presence and your power. I long for that. I know we as a community long for that. We long for our families and our neighbors and our country and our world to awaken to God's power. See, we want to see renewal in our own hearts. We want to see revival on a massive scale. We long for spiritual spiritual renewal. Can I get an amen, please? Yes, this is what we long for. See, we're in this sermon series because we want it. We're looking for it. So how do we posture ourselves to receive it? What is Jesus' first word to us about how to see the kingdom of God that has come near? He says, repent. We want times of refreshing. Repent. We want renewal. We want restoration. We want to see God's presence in our midst. So repent. Renewal follows repentance. Let me say that again. Renewal follows repentance. So what is repentance? Today we're going to look at a story in the Old Testament about King Asa. We'll be in 2 Chronicles 14 to 16. You can turn with me there. Um, a little bit of background about 2 Chronicles. There's obviously then a 1 Chronicles as well. And in the original Hebrew Bible, there was just one book called Chronicles, but they split it in two because of scroll length, which I think is a very practical reason to have two books. And in our Bibles, 1 and 2 Chronicles takes place after 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings. And if we're honest, we usually just kind of skip over Chronicles because it feels like a repeat of a lot of the stories from those earlier books. But in the original ordering of the Hebrew Bible, Chronicles is actually the last book. And that's because it's a summary of all of the Jewish scriptures. The first word in 1 Chronicles is Adam. That's the name of the first human character in the the scriptures. And then it goes all the way to the very end of 2 Chronicles, the last paragraph, announcing the return of Israel from exile. So this is a summation of the story of God's people. If you want to learn more about 1 and 2 Chronicles, Bible Project has a great video that you can learn about. They have great videos about everything. Um, So this is what we see in this story. It's the summary of God's story with his people, that God delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. He made a covenant with them that he would be their God and they would be his people. He gave them the law so that they would know how to follow him. He set kings over them to help guide them to be faithful to the covenant. That's their story. And yet there's this continual pull away, this pull to worship other gods, but the one true God, Yahweh. And in this summary story, we see that pattern of formation, deformation, and reformation, the forming of God's people, but then they turn away, and then he invites them back. And what does he do? What's that invitation? It's through repentance. So we see in Asa's story that God is going to do a work of renewal through repentance. And I want us to see the two components of repentance. The first is a turning from something, and then turning to, turning from our idols I'm turning to seeking the Lord. So the beginning of King Asa's story in 2 Chronicles 14, it says Asa became king after his father Abijah dies. 
And it tells us, Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord. He removed foreign idols and high places, where, places where people were worshiping false gods. He tells the people to seek the Lord. Um, when an army comes against them, he, uh, he cries out to God and he sees God save them. See, Asa, Asa was doing good and right things for the Lord. That's what we want. We, we want to do good and right things for the Lord. But Asa's own actions weren't enough to bring about spiritual renewal for the community because a true act of repentance must take place. And we see this throughout scripture that repentance is first initiated by an encounter with God. And that's what happens. We can look at chapter 15, starting in verse one. The spirit of God came on Azariah, son of Oded. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach and without the law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he was found by them. So here we see this encounter with God is the beginning of repentance. When we come face to face with God's glory, with his mercy, we recognize our own need, our own depravity. So here the spirit of God comes, he brings a word to the community through this prophet. And in the word, there's both an invitation and a challenge. There's an invitation that when you seek the Lord, you will find him. But also there's this challenge, the people were not living according to God's word and his law. And for us too, when we encounter God, he will give us an invitation and a challenge. He will challenge us to look at the places that we need to turn from, and he will invite us to walk with him. And in God's kindness, Romans 2 tells us that it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance, that he will initiate this, uh, in this encounter our repentance. And so that's what happens when we continue in verse 8. It says, when Asa heard these words in the prophecy of Zariah, son of Oded the prophet, he took courage. He removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin, from the towns he had captured in the hills of Ephraim. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. Then he assembled all Judah and Benjamin and the people from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon who had settled among them. For large numbers had come over to him from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was, the Lord his God was with him. They assembled at Jerusalem in the third month of the 15th year of Asa's reign. At that time, they sacrificed to the Lord 700 head of cattle and 7,000 sheep and goats from the plunder they had brought back. So here we're going to see the components of repentance. There's a turning from and there's a turning to. But before you can turn from something and turn to something different, you actually have to acknowledge what are you, what are you turning to? What have you put your hope in? What have you put your trust in? What are you focusing on? You have to acknowledge that. And that's what we do every week in our confession. We say, most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We, we acknowledge, we do it corporately and we need to do it privately as well. We acknowledge those places that we have not lived as God created us to. Asa and the people of Judah had allowed the worship of other gods to seep into their land detestable idols had cropped up all over. And what is an idol? Well, it's something that you look to when you're fearful or anxious or have desires or whatever, and you're saying, this is what's gonna give me what I want. This is what I'm gonna put my trust in. This is what I'm gonna put my hope in. In the Old Testament, they had idols like Baal, the Canaanite god of rain, or Asherah, the goddess of fertility. So when the people were desperate for control or they were anxious or they were seeking abundance or they wanted to live the good life, they had this temptation to turn to these idols instead of trusting in God. Now we may not have wooden poles or idols of stone, but we cry out to our own gods of money and science and health and beauty and pleasure. The renewal of the people of God began with acknowledging their idols and then removing them. Now, sometimes we think of repentance as like a gentle floating away from something. Like, oh, I have envy in my heart, so I'm just gonna like drop it over there and move over here. Like, no, repentance is a violent dismantling of our idols. Yeah. 
confessing them and then tearing them down, removing them not just from a few hills, but from the whole region. We have to root them out from our hearts and lives. In fact, in verse 16, it says, King Asa also deposed his grandmother, Maka, from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive image for the worship of Asherah. Asa cut it down, broke it up, and burned it in the Kidron Valley. He overthrew his own grandmother in the act of turning away from idolatry. Church, are there places in your heart that you need to confess and dismantle? Are there detestable idols that have seeped in that you need to call out and then cut down? How is God inviting you to take this first step of repentance? Maybe, there's, maybe you've held bitterness, or there's lust, or greed, there's pride. As is often the case when I preach a passage, God makes sure this is applicable to me. And so in his kindness, uh, God has revealed some idols of envy and comparison that I have, I have allowed to set up shop in my own heart. And in his mercy, his kindness, he's, he's kind of prodded me with it this week, and it's uncomfortable. It's because he wants me to, to acknowledge them and give them up and turn from them. And why? Because when I hold on to envy, when I hold on to comparison, I'm believing that my worth and identity come from what I have or from looking more like that person than finding my identity in Christ. See, when we encounter the one true God, he invites us to acknowledge those places of sin and idolatry and then tear them down and turn from them. This is the first step of repentance and it's the beginning of spiritual renewal. So not only do we see the people in this story confess and turn from their idols, they need to now turn and restore true worship to God. And verse 8 says, Asa, re Asa repaired the altar for worship in the temple. And then in verse 11, the people brought their sacrifices again to God. In verse 12, we say, they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart and soul. All who would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, were to be put to death, whether small or great, man or woman. This is something that people imposed on themselves. God didn't tell them to do this. This just shows the, the seriousness that they were taking to, to, about turning to God. In verse 14, they took an oath to the Lord with loud acclamation, with shouting and with trumpets and horns. There's this public proclamation of turning to God. All Judah rejoiced about the oath because they had sworn it wholeheartedly. So here's the second part of repentance. We don't just confess our sins and then you know, turn from them and stop. We need to choose a new direction to go. It's like if we're trying to get to Park Meadows Mall and we're driving west on C470, the, direct, the exact opposite direction we wanna go. We have to realize and acknowledge, oh, I'm going the wrong way. We need to get off. But it's not enough to just stop and then hope we get there. We actually need to loop around and get on C470 East. We need to choose what we are moving towards. And here, King Asa and the people of Judah turned towards Yahweh in both their actions, they began to bring their sacrifices again, but also wholeheartedly. Several times in these few verses, we hear this repeated, they sought the Lord wholeheartedly. They're seeking God with their heart and soul. They turned to God. So church, what does it look like for you to seek the Lord? to turn to him with all of your heart and soul. We know, based on our experiences, that the things of this world will not satisfy. And so what will? Walking with Jesus, turning to him. So we need to make that conscious choice. And what does that look like? What does it look like for you to seek the Lord, to turn to him with all of your heart and soul? I think that's gonna look different in a lot of ways based on your life and how you connect with the Lord. Um, I can say I'm in a season with little kids and a full plate, so my good desire to spend hours of quiet, uninterrupted time with the Lord is probably not realistic. But what is realistic is for me to walk with him every day in the ordinary, normal parts of my day. One of my favorite verses in scripture is out of Galatians 5, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So as I'm anxious, or I'm frustrated, or I'm angry, or I'm overwhelmed, 
or I, I just don't feel connected to the Lord and I just don't want to praise him. Whatever it is, um, I can choose to stay still and hold that. That's just not gonna do me any good. Or I can choose to turn, to take a breath and pray and say, I'm gonna seek you, Lord Jesus, with all my heart. I've started a little practice recently where I light a candle signifying the presence of the Spirit. And when I find, I catch myself in those moments of anxiety or frustration or the Lord convicts me of sin, that I physically kneel before it and I say, Lord, I, I want to let go of the things I've held on to and I want to turn to you. God has given us this beautiful gift of repentance. And church, renewal follows repentance. We see that promise at the end of verse 15. They sought God eagerly and he was found by them. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. They sought God and he was found by them and gave them rest. Rest from war, from striving, from conflict, from idolatry. God's presence refreshed them. He renewed them. See, that is what we are longing for, the spiritual renewal. God's presence to be near, that when we seek him, we will find him. And the invitation is that renewal follows repentance. And is repentance a one-time thing, church? No. See, we will need to come back to it again and again and again. All of life is repentance. And it's God's kindness, his patience, his mercy, his love that invites us to repent again. And why will we need to? It's because we're like the dog Doug from the movie Up. If you've seen that movie, Doug can talk and he's talking to someone, he can be focused on something, and then all of a sudden, squirrel, squirrel, you know, that's us. The flashy things from this world, money and appearance and power and self-sufficiency will draw our attention away from God. And unfortunately, that is how King Asa's story ends. See, Asa led the people of God in a season of renewal, of reformation through repentance. He saw God's power and presence and yet in chapter 16, he forgot. Another threat came, another army came um, to declare war. And instead of trusting in God like he did earlier in his story, he actually took things into his own hands. It says he went to the temple, he desecrated the temple, and he took the gold and silver that was designated for God. And he took it and he tried to do a shrewd deal with another, a third king over here, to try to avoid the conflict and the hard circumstance in front of him. And God, in his kindness, invites Asa to repentance. He reveals himself again. He sends another prophet to speak a word to Asa. And in verse 7 of chapter 16, it says, At that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from your hand. Were not the Cushites and Libyans a mighty army with great numbers of chariots and horsemen? Yet when you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. You've already seen this, Asa. Verse 9, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on you will be at war. So not at peace, not at rest. Verse 10, Asa was angry with the seer because of this. He was so enraged that he put him in prison. At the same time, Asa brutally oppressed some of the people. So here, God's kindness, he wants Asa to encounter him and to invite him to conviction, to repentance, to turn from his evil ways, and yet Asa got stuck in his sin and his stubbornness. And he ends his story in verse 11, the events of Asa's reign from beginning to end are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was afflicted with a disease in his feet. Though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from the physicians. What a different ending we see in chapter 16 than chapter 15. The same promise is given. Repent through repentance when you seek the Lord, he will be found by you. The eyes of the Lord are looking for people who are seeking him to strengthen them, to renew them, revive them. And I want us to hear a really important word from the warning at the ending of Asa's story. And here it is. Repentance is always an option. You are not too far gone or too stuck in sin or too broken. 
Jesus continues to say, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. The invitation of repentance is available to you. Confess, dismantle the high places in your heart, and then turn and seek the Lord with all your heart and soul, and he will be found by you. And we will live on re- with repentance on repeat. We repent again and again and again, and the spiritual renewal we long for will follow a posture of repentance. Now, we don't want to just say these words. We actually want to experience them and encounter the Lord. And so we're now going to go into a time where we're going to receive from the Lord. We're going to have a time of reflection. We're going to hear a song. And we want to just come open-hearted and say, Lord, what, what word do you have for me? Where do I need to turn to you? And we also want to provide intentional space of prayer. So like last week, we'll have two different spaces of prayer in the back. On the right side, is, on my right side, is a place for intercessory prayer. That's the kind of prayer that we typically have. So if you go back there, there'll be prayer ministers in the back who would love to sit and pray with you and just help bring your burdens to the Lord. On this side, on the left side, will be soaking prayer. And that's just a space, we've, it's a set apart space to say, I wanna sit here and surrender and experience you, Lord. And there'll be prayer ministers walking behind you. They might put their hand on your shoulder. They just are praying for you to experience and encounter the Lord. And they're going to be back there as soon as we start this song. They're going to stay through the end of the service. There'll be communion servers in the back as well, so you don't have to feel rushed to come to the table for communion. Um, But our, our hope is that we experience God's spiritual renewal. See, church, Jesus tells us in the Gospels, there is more rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And can we imagine the rejoicing in heaven when a community lives out of a posture of repentance? So I pray that we hear this invitation, that we respond by turning from our idols, turning from the things that we have thought would give us life, and turning to seeking God. And as we do that, we will experience freedom 